Hello all of the person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be trying to resolve one of the bigger mysteries of planet Mars. At least that's what the paper in the description below tries to do. The mystery, of course, well, let's see if you can guess what it is. Although I bet you've already guessed based on the title. The mystery is right here in this picture. The beautiful picture taken by the Perseverance rover of what appears to be an ancient river delta. Yet at the same time, it's in the middle of what seems to be a completely deserted place. There's nothing here, there's no water, and there's really no possibility of having water in the current conditions on this planet. But the sign is still there, suggesting that this place was filled with rivers and possibly even deep oceans as well. So how is it possible that Mars used to have liquid water, yet today it's basically a deserted and barren planet? Now obviously one potential answer is that, well, it might have had thicker atmosphere and maybe the sun was warmer or producing more heat and, well, maybe there was a combination of things that we just don't understand yet. But none of this is very specific and very conclusive. So really, how is it that Mars used to have liquid oceans? Now the most common answer today is that it was either A, it was maybe only possible during some major collisions, like the one you saw right now, that would heat up the planet just enough to cause the liquid oceans and rivers to flow on the planet. So in other words, maybe it was only during the so-called late heavy bombardment or some other era when the planet experienced a lot of different collisions. But that of course means that these rivers or these lakes would only exist for maybe a couple of years maximum. This would not really explain how a river delta like this would form. This would probably require at least a few hundreds of years. So the collision explanation is not really that good. It does not explain everything we're observing. However, it does explain some of the observations from the surface, such as, I don't know if I can find it here, actually I'm gonna have to cheat and use one of the other pictures. This picture right here from the study I discussed a few years ago that shows us the outlines of ancient tsunamis that created these really, really large deposits. And the scientists a few years ago discovered what seems to be the crater responsible for creating these tsunamis. It was most likely from a collision by a really large asteroid that hit the planet right in the middle of the ocean. Which of course implies that the ocean was already there. And so if not the collisions, there was probably something else happening here. The only other explanation we can think of are a lot of greenhouse gases. But usually greenhouse gases, or at least certain gases, produce um, chemical reactions on the surface. And just based on what the scientists have studied so far, none of these gases really explain the presence of the water once again. At least not to the extent where it would make Mars warm enough and have enough atmosphere to basically have the water. So for example, we know that Mars has a little bit of methane on the surface, but methane generally gets destroyed in the atmosphere pretty quickly. So as a greenhouse gas, it's not really that good to maintain for a very, very long period of time, unless a lot of methane was produced by something on Mars. We also know that carbon dioxide, CO2, is an excellent greenhouse gas, but you need to have a lot of it, way more than Mars currently has, and this would also create certain signs on the surface that would basically show us that Mars was very different and very CO2 rich. This is not what scientists observe currently. Then we have gases like nitrous oxide, ozone, CFCs and HCFCs or hydrofluorocarbons, and there are no signs of any of those on Mars either. So what else do we have? Well, one of the most potent gases is actually water. Water gas is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. But in this case, you would need to have a lot of it and it would need to stay in Martian atmosphere long term to create these necessary conditions. And so can this be our answer? Well, as a spoiler, the answer is yes. But there is a much more detailed and more interesting answer that I'm going to discuss right now. So first of all, in order for greenhouse gases to actually do their work, they do have to stay in the atmosphere long enough. So like I mentioned, methane is just not in the atmosphere long enough on Earth to play a big enough role. Usually it's destroyed by oxygen really quickly. Then a lot of other gases like ozone, even though they are also greenhouse gases, they're just not present in large enough quantities to make a difference. But at the same time, when it comes to Mars, because of its distance from the Sun and also because of the history of the Sun, it would need to have a tremendous amount of greenhouse gases to be much warmer than it is today. And it's also important to remember that back then, approximately 3 to 4 billion years ago, the Sun was actually much much cooler on average. It produced approximately 30% less light. This is today known as the faint young Sun paradox. The paradox being the fact that we know that Mars and Earth seem to have had water on the surface, but back then the Sun was just much cooler. 
This graph right here, specifically this part, shows you how the solar luminosity and the amount of energy produced by the sun changed in the last few billions of years. Now this of course implies that Mars was receiving a lot less solar energy back in the days. And it also implies that it needed a lot more atmosphere and a lot more greenhouse gases to have warm enough conditions on the surface. So this basically creates a paradox that's kind of currently impossible to answer. But the paper in the description might have actually found one answer that doesn't break any laws and presents something really interesting nobody ever considered. It does consider the water vapor as the potential explanation to everything. Now, first of all, when it comes to clouds, most of our understanding of how clouds are created and also what they do to the planet really comes from planet Earth. And we do seem to have different types of clouds possible from clouds forming on Mars or really any other planet. Now, our clouds generally can be classified as relatively low altitude and also somewhat reflective. In other words, for the most part, the clouds on the planet reflect the light and thus lower the temperature of the surface. The more clouds our planet has, the cooler the surface should technically get. And so by increasing the amount of water vapor, the planet can generally regulate its own temperature. So higher water vapor means more clouds, means lower temperature, which then leads to more precipitation and the cooling of the planet. This is normally how the planet self-regulates. But in order to try to explain how Mars could have similar conditions, the previous papers established that this would require some really unusual, very, very thick clouds in somewhat unusual altitudes which could not possibly exist on Mars. In other words, the water vapor clouds did not really explain anything in some of the previous studies. And so generally the scientists abandoned this idea thinking that something else was happening on the surface. But the scientists in this paper used a global climate model to try to simulate something a little bit different, and they did discover something really interesting. They were able to model Martian surface with an average temperature of just around minus 8 degrees Celsius, which would generally be enough to have at least some water on the surface. And they were also able to simulate this for approximately several hundred years, suggesting that there was a way for Mars to maintain these conditions with just water vapor. But what did they do different and how was their Mars different from previous experiments? Well, first of all, the water on Mars could not be this way. It could not be everywhere. Their Mars had to be extremely patchy. The water only existed in certain locations. And some other locations had to have a lot of ice present on the surface as well. As a matter of fact, if there was a lot of ice present in different locations on the planet, it would create a very unusual condition on the planet compared to planet Earth. Here, the presence of ice patches around the planet, such as for example on different tops of mountains or at the poles, would create a lot of dry air all over the planet. And as the water evaporates or sublimates from these locations, it sort of starts spreading itself across the planet, going into drier regions, which would then start forming clouds. But with thinner air conditions and with colder temperatures, this would result in essentially snow, and as these snowflakes fall to the surface, they basically sublimate again and end up producing these long-term high-altitude clouds that do have a tendency to warm the planet overall. And so the presence of these somewhat dry climates with somewhat warm conditions and a lot of patchy locations with water and ice on the surface can result in a production of a thin layer of high-altitude clouds that would not actually be that easily visible and would not reflect light, but instead trap a lot of heat on the surface of Mars, thus allowing it to become warmer than it would be otherwise. And though generally thick clouds reflect light from the sun, the thin clouds, as you see in this image by NASA, do create conditions that warm up the planet. And so by having a lot of these thin clouds all over the surface, Mars could have easily maintained conditions for liquid water to exist for a very, very long time. In this particular case, the scientists determined that by having these patches of water and by having the humidity of about 25%, it would be more than enough to produce enough of these clouds to warm up the entire planet to about minus 8 degrees Celsius, around 46 Fahrenheit. And considering this is an average temperature, obviously some regions would be much warmer and thus have liquid water on the surface. With a lot more water probably also coming from within Mars itself, from underground, where a lot of underground rivers could easily feed into these larger lakes, rivers and oceans, and thus allow more clouds to be created over time. And so in short, this analysis does suggest that not only do we not need any unusual explanations for how Mars was able to maintain liquid water, 
but it also allows us to understand what most likely happened to Mars over time and how it changed and transformed into what it is today. Obviously, since water is an excellent greenhouse gas, it would basically explain how Mars was so warm, but because water is easily broken up by solar radiation, over time all of this radiation would create a lot of hydrogen and oxygen, with hydrogen escaping into the outer atmosphere and oxygen interacting with the surface of Mars, oxidizing it and turning it red as it is today. And even though the sun did warm up over time and increased its luminosity by about 30% in the last 4.5 billion years, this was not unfortunately enough for Mars to maintain its atmosphere. Over time, Mars lost most of its water, while also losing the majority of its atmosphere as well. But I guess the question is, well, could something like this also happen to planet Earth, and can clouds on Earth also cause these dramatic greenhouse effects? And the answer is most likely no, simply because of the way that the scientists in this paper believe the water cycle differs between Earth and Mars. So on Earth, when water evaporates, it doesn't actually linger in the atmosphere very long. It does turn into clouds, but those clouds precipitate pretty quickly. And this is because we already have so much water on the surface, and so the water cycle is extremely quick. But on a dry, warm Mars, the water evaporating would actually stay in the atmosphere much, much longer. It would maybe not even precipitate for at least a year, while also having very patchy locations where water was present as well. And because of this, any clouds on Mars would most likely stay in there for much, much longer periods of time, also be very thin and barely visible, and instead of reflecting light would absorb light, warming up the planet in the process. With the other major difference being the way that the water moves on the surface. On Mars, it's very likely that all of this evaporated water would most likely spread across the entire planet and create relatively similar clouds across the entire surface of Mars. This would then allow the entire surface of Mars to warm up relatively equally. On Earth, though, water evaporates and precipitates in more unequal conditions. Sometimes we have places that are deserts, where there's almost no rain. Sometimes we have places that are rainforests. And because of this, we have so many different clouds on the planet, and also so many different conditions that allow the planet to continuously maintain its water cycle. But the situation on Mars was very different, and looks like it was very unstable. Unstable enough to turn the planet into a desert world, eventually resulting in the Mars we know today. And so this paper so far presents one of the best explanations for why Mars is the way it is today, and how this unusual desert world was able to maintain warm conditions for liquid water to exist. But it also presents an interesting opportunity for us to study how clouds actually influence planets, and how one day we might potentially use clouds to modify the climate of planets like Earth, or maybe even planets like Mars. But I'll actually be talking about this in one of the future videos, because some countries have already done so very successfully. But anyway, looks like this here is no longer a mystery and does have a really really interesting and very specific explanation. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying this wonderful Mars-related wonderful person t-shirt that you can find in the description. Either way, come back tomorrow to learn something else, stay wonderful, and as always, bye-bye.